All right, uh, colleagues, welcome back. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to chair this particular panel on taking stock of the Commonwealth addressing one of, uh, to my mind, the, the principal challenges to Commonwealth um, values and good governance, uh, the challenges to media freedom. And uh, I think we are discussing this at a particularly important time, a really inflection point in history because of the acceleration of existing trends, but also the introduction of new pressures as a direct consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I am Dr. Sue Onslow. I am Deputy Director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. I'm also the coordinator of the Media Freedom uh, Center at the Institute that we have run for the last three years. Um, this investigates the institutional, political, uh, structural and legal constraints that confront uh, Commonwealth countries. And we run a series of seminars um, on various aspects of challenges to media freedom in the, con in the context of elections. Um, we uh, organized an international conference on media and religion earlier this year. And in January 2020, we convened a panel discussion on Kigali 2020, how serious is the Commonwealth about media freedom? which we ran at the Houses of Parliament together with the all parliamentary um, group on human rights, at which Amal Clooney, the UK Special Envoy for Media Freedom, was the keynote speaker. Um, we also host a website um, on the ICWS main website, which uh, posts regular news reports and updates of, uh, from individual countries of pressures on journalists, attacks on editorial freedom, and also we do like to post good news when it does rarely come there. Um, we are, uh, the ICWS is also proud to be a member of the working group of Commonwealth partner institutions, which has crafted the Commonwealth principles on media freedom of expression and the role of media um, in good governance. Um, so this panel discussion, Oh, one moment, Rita is coming back. Um, this panel discussion um, on taking stock, as I said, comes at a particular time. Guy Black, um, who of course chairs the board of the Commonwealth Press Union Media Trust, commented to me when I started up the ICS, um, ICWS Media Freedom Center, that each generation has to fight the battle for media freedom. And we are indeed confronting a major battle, I believe, across the, across the Commonwealth. Article five of the Commonwealth's uh, 2013 Charter commits its signatories to, and I quote, peaceful open dialogue and free flow of information, including through a free responsible media and to enhancing democratic uh, traditions and strengthening democratic processes. So it gives me great pleasure to chair this panel. Um, Professor Sanjoy Hazarika um, will be the first speaker and he will uh, we will focus our discussion around his contribution and remarks in the first 20 minutes because he is obliged to leave um, to take part in uh, another major international uh, webinar. Uh, Professor Hazarika is, of course, a leading human rights activist, scholar, author and veteran journalist and filmmaker and is currently international director for CHRI. Um, Fellow panelists will put their questions to him and I will invite also questions uh, from the chat function, um, which of course runs um, on the right hand side of your screen. Um, this uh, will be followed then by Professor Shakuntala, uh, Shakuntala Banaji, Professor of Media, Culture and Social Change in the Department of Media and Communications mm -hmm. at the London School of Economics where she also serves as Director of Graduate Studies and Programme Director for the MSc Programme in Media, Communications and Development. So we are enormously fortunate to have another speaker with extensive expertise um, in media and the Global South. Thirdly, I'm delighted to welcome Kayuri Soyinka, um, the leading Nigerian journalist, published, publisher um, and author, founder, publisher and editor-in-chief of Africa Today magazine, um, and our fourth speaker who uh, will join us is Mrs. Rita Payne, journalist, media consultant, president emeritus of the Commonwealth Journalists Association, um, who is a former member of the BBC World Service Radio, where she was a news editor, producer and presenter before moving to BBC World News TV as Asia editor. So if I may, um, uh, Sanjoy, if I could invite you, please, to begin with your remarks, I had asked each of our panelists to consider 
what were existing, but also accelerating trends across the Commonwealth concerning media freedom, and also to consider what more can the Commonwealth do to address these issues. So Sanjoy, if I may. Thank you. Uh, I hope I can be heard. Yes, I believe so. I, you're coming okay. through to me loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, uh, Dr. Philip Murphy and fellow panelists and the ICWS for organizing the program. Uh, first of all, we are all aware that these issues and concerns that you flag go beyond the Commonwealth, although we are here to discuss issues within the 54-member organization. Because across the world, we face a growing trend towards authoritarianism, even in countries which have long known to be, have been long known to be democratic, and increasingly so during the pandemic, when freedom of movement has been highly restricted, as is freedom of assembly, information is hardly is sharply curtailed with huge dependence on official sources. Fake news proliferates. And the countries of the Commonwealth, frankly, are no exception. They're part of this trend. And the spaces of media freedom and freedom of expression are shrinking. Surveillance is growing. Digital insecurity is on the rise. The pandemic has ensured that my office, for instance, will be, has been closed for the past three months. But the first thing I used to see when I walked in there is a poster that marks those journalists who have been killed by state or non-state actors over the past years. I understand that fewer journalists have been killed worldwide this year than perhaps any other year in the past decade. Perhaps that is a reason to, to uh, if not celebrate, to be grateful. But as in all cases, there are major issues and other concerns. Let me cite a couple and ask what we can do about. The pandemic has hit economies across the world very hard. And the most vulnerable is, of course, are the poor and marginalized. The media is no exception. It may not be poor or marginalized, but it is dramatically affected. Ad revenues have shrunk for the traditional print media, and many are desperately trying to shift to paywalls in digital spaces, online spaces. The traditional media business model is at complete risk. A publisher in Sri Lanka told a friend of mine, if we can manage with 40% of our employees, why should I have 100? And another editor friend in Bangladesh says, I have the resources to pay my staff for this month. I don't know about next month because we've lost 60% at least of our income. So in addition to shrinking revenue, you also have job losses. Across South Asia, whether it's India or Pakistan or elsewhere, journalists are being sacked, not in ones or twos, but literally in scores. In one recent incident, 150 journalists in a major paper in New Delhi were given their notices. Now, this raises a fundamental question. If the independent media does not survive, how will media freedom and freedom of expression survive? That's a fundamental question. What are the strategies to mitigate and adapt to use climate change technology to create a leaner, meaner, better, and more agile media? I don't know the answers to that, but this is something that some of us are, are discussing. I'll make a couple of other points and then close. Uh, in uh, South Asia, we have founded what's called the South Asia Media Defenders Network, which is uh, which has co-conveners from every country in South Asia, except Afghanistan. Uh, and one of our predominant concerns has been to mobilize around pressure and independent, in, intimidation of independent journalists and media, because that has grown. It's grown from governments, from officials, and politically connected people who don't agree with what is published or broadcast. So can we develop, for instance, a law or a policy or an approach to protect journalists? Because they are under attack. For instance, in Bangladesh, you have the Digital Security Act in which a large number of cases have been filed against uh, prominent and uh, local reporters. 
The same has happened in other parts of South Asia. In Pakistan, one of the leading editors of uh, the country has been in jail on a 30-year-old uh, charge. So the intimidation takes numerous forms. It's criminal defamation, which seems to be a preferred route, which uh, carry jail terms. Brutal, extensive trolling, especially of women journalists, physical intimidation, and targeted attacks. And fake news, as we all know, is a toxic realm of its own. But I'm also encouraged by the growing number of media houses which are investing in fact-checking. Finally, I see this as an opportunity to use new tools, or rather tools which have been around but which have not been used extensively by journalists because they're seen as too slow to ferret out information. I am referring specifically to the Right to Information Act or the Freedom of Information Act in other countries, which exist in more than 30 countries of the Commonwealth, but few journalists use them to get information from government. And more and more journalists, I know certainly in this country, in India, are using that. And I want to close with an example of something that happened really in the last two weeks, which gives me some hope that things are possible to change. Uh, we had filed, uh, CHRI, filed a right to information uh, request with the chief labor commissioner asking about a statement he had made, which landed in my email, that he wanted the entire uh, information about the migrants who were moving, as all of us have seen this tragic movement of people over the past months during the lockdown, the large number of migrants, but how many migrants were there? And he had sent a message out saying that I want this information in three days. After that, nobody heard anything about it. So we filed an, an information request. The inf response came that the, the government, that particular department did not have the information at all. So we filed another request and the chief information commissioner, which is uh, the information commission of the country, uh, wrapped the government across the knuckles and said, within a week, you have to present all the information that you have. And within a week, it was there of how many million migrants were moving or had moved or were in camps. And to me, that's a good example uh, because it shows the relevance of using systems which work. And it became a huge news story. And it still remains a major news story. So often uh, it's the message which is important and we need to find different ways of getting access to that message. And I think we'll survive. Uh, not because uh, we're particularly good at doing what we do, but we need to get better at it. We need to be more professional, more adept, adept, and adapt, adapt, again, to use climate change, to adapt and mitigate loss. I'll close here because I know that uh, time is uh, uh, important for, for this uh, uh, group, for this panel. I'm happy to take questions and uh, try and you know, answer them if, if that's possible. Thank you. Sanjay, thank you very much indeed, particularly for underlining the, 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 the everyday pressures and how they're accelerating on physical closure of independent media and that the uh, traditional business model of, of print media is, is facing an existential crisis and needs to be fundamentally reconfigured. Of course, with so much of uh, Commonwealth media houses depending upon government advertising rather than being able to draw upon advertising from the private sector. Um, and thank you also for emphasizing where there are possibilities for, and opportunities which could be explored. Um, may I ask your colleagues, uh, are there questions that you'd like to, to put to Sandro before he leaves? Uh, Professor Banerjee, uh, is that, as an expert in, in media in South Asia, um, would, would you like to, to comment or, or to put a particular question uh, to your colleague? Well, I'm going to take this up. It was obviously wonderful to hear you, Sanjay, and um, much of what I'm going to say is more the minutiae building on that broad overview that you gave. But I guess, I guess I don't feel as hopeful as you do at the moment, partly because I've seen a tendency towards the taking down of any law that has been used to make the government provide information. So I wondered what you thought. So for instance, in in Pakistan around issues to do with Balochistan or in Indian 
in Indian government circles around issues to do with Kashmir. I wondered if you could say a few words on your thoughts on those situations and journalism there. Well, I think these these are you know very. I I am not sanguine about the future. Uh, let me correct. I am hopeful in pockets because I think uh, that is the only practical thing we can. Because if we lose hope, then we might as well give up the story. So we have to keep fighting at what where we where we where we can. But as far as these specific issues are concerned, I think the it's it's a real problem because um, you know. Uh, there are some media houses which cover these issues uh, reasonably well and uh, the majority don't and the battle that you're fighting uh, is essentially against uh, a very toxic narrative that is flowing across the airwaves almost every day so if uh, if one is taking even an, an independent very sensible position you stand uh, the uh, good, a good chance of just being overwhelmed by the flood, shall I say. But, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, uh, for instance, the other day, uh, uh, the, the head of Republic Television faced, I think, uh, several cases of uh, criminal defamation, etc., etc. Now, I think all of us, we may disagree with him. We, I think that people like him, have the right to to uh, to to his point of view. We may completely disagree with him, but it puts us in a rather difficult situation because you have to uh, protect. You have to stand up for freedom of expression, and you can't make exceptions. No, so that's that is the challenge before many of us. Sanjay, if, if I may, I'm very aware time is short. You talked about pockets. Should we look at, I mean, obviously the vast multimedia landscape across the, the, the huge uh, subcontinent of India, looking more at state level rather than emphasizing a national narrative. So looking at a particular media houses, particular areas of activity, but also particular uh, states across India where, where frameworks are, are more robust, that there do seem to be greater uh, opportunities and greater latitude? Well, I don't know about that because uh, I think that uh, the states are run by politicians and politicians run a lot of business media houses okay. and yeah. media houses have television <laughs> channels and they carry the stories that they their patrons want. So it's, uh, I mean, there are very few, uh, uh, very few, uh, shall we say, uh, states in the country where the local, either the chief minister or a very senior powerful politician in the opposition or the government does not run a media channel and they don't do it for altruistic reasons or for, uh, for anything else, you know, the, it, a point of view is carried. So, yeah, you would have some, uh, some exceptions to the rule. For instance, you have in, in Chhattisgarh, you have a law for the protection of journalists. It's not a great law. In Maharashtra also, they're developing one. In Maharashtra, they have a law. In Chhattisgarh, they're developing a law for the protection of journalists. Yeah, and okay. all we do know that there have been many incidents there. So it's 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 a it's a very mixed bag, and uh, uh, you can't really have independent media unless you have. Uh, and this is a very old problem, unless you have really independent sources of income, and that mm -hmm. is the crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, Coyote, do you want to add uh, to put a question from? Uh, I think I probably have to leave right now. Yes. Uh, oh wait, I, I think that in that case, I think what we may have to do as as uh, Sanjoy is thank you very much indeed, Coyote. I apologise about this. Sanjoy has just said he thinks he needs to leave right now because it is on the point of ten twenty. Um, yeah, so I, I have ten minutes to go before I I shift continents. So. Oh, okay, so <laughs> I'm. Sanjay, would you would you like to, to leave the, the discussion now at this point to compose yourself or do you have time to take Coyote's question? Well, I really must go because the others are in the other chat room. The other okay, discussion. I'm sorry, Coyote, I apologize. I, I feel I'm going to cut you sorry, short. Coyote, but uh, we'll for... keep in touch and uh, we'll co communicate because I'm sure you're facing some of these problems. I know I'm... you are. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Sandra Hazarika, and uh, best wishes for your participation in the other online conference. We're enormously grateful you took the time to join us today. Um, uh, Coyote, if I may come to you as the third speaker, but if I may move to the second speaker on our panel. Um,
Uh, Professor Shakuntala uh, Banerjee, you wanted to add some uh, more detail and texture, you said, to the, the opening um, grand survey uh, remarks that, that Sanjoy highlighted as, as a key and important trends. Would you, would you like to, to make your opening remarks now, please? Thank you, Sue. Thank you, colleagues. Um, it's obviously a really, really wide and extremely difficult to topic to talk about media freedom, but I wanted to talk about um, four things which I think have led up to the situation we are in now. And I think this probably um, also applies in Nigeria as well as it does in South Asia, but my area of expertise is clearly more in South Asia and in Latin America. But one of the things um, I think it's really important to talk about is the co-option of various media houses and journalists. I think Sanjay referred to that right at the end of his talk. Not just the co-option, but the complicity of those media houses in censoring their own journalists, in preventing their journalists from reporting on things. It's truly my belief that the freedom of media across a country and across a region is only as good as the freedom of media and expression of the very least of the people in that country. And I think what we've been seeing increasingly alongside authoritarianism in governance and alongside authoritarianism within populations and a sort of um, populist nationalism riding, rising across parts of South Asia is also a tendency for um, flag waving when it appears that one can cut off a part of the nation and leave it aside and that the media freedom of journalists in that part of the nation um, tends to be um, forgotten by the rest of the population while everything that they're experiencing uh, jives with the mainstream narrative. And this has taken place in multiple places. It's clearly been taking place in Bangladesh over a long period of time. We saw it in the conjunction of state and non-state actors in the murders of bloggers um, a few years back in the kidnappings and intimidation of anyone who spoke out about religious freedom. We've seen it in recent days in the various different um, FIRs and court cases filed against journalists to shut them up in reporting on the deficiencies in the COVID responses in Pakistan, India, and in Bangladesh. We've seen it in Sri Lanka around the reporting of anything to do with the violent history and past of the, of the government and of the way in which it dealt with so-called terrorism in the recent past. And as one goes through a list, so if you talk about the places I just mentioned, Balochistan, Kashmir, if you talk about religious freedom and reporting on religious freedom in Pakistan and in India, I think you begin to see that over the last 10 years, there's been a history. This is a living history. So the place we find ourselves at now, where if you want to file even a very, very mild story saying that um, people in a hospital, in a rural hospital in part of Chhattisgarh or some part of India do not have the correct personal protective equipment, and you file your story and you find yourself suddenly either jailed or picked up or silenced or dropped by your media house because they've been intimidated into doing so, this is not something that came out of the blue. There's been a, a history of ignoring and neglecting problems. So for instance, in Kashmir, you had the revocation of the special status and then they had a media blackout and a, a media blackout in such a way that nothing was going in and nothing was coming out, no communications, and I want to emphasize that no communications in a day and age when you have COVID is so, so very difficult for all of those people. And you have journalists who are simply reporting the news, taking photographs. A simple photograph could get you um, a court case against you, could get you something filed against you. So that kind of intimidation. So the second side of it is that there are journalists who are collaborating. And I think from my perspective, looking at the situation of, of the journalists who report with ethics and integrity, you would have to call them collaborators in the same sense as you did with the Nazi and fascist regimes in Europe in the 1930s. So these people are collaborators. They are spreading fake news, misinformation and disinformation, which is put out by governments. And I think in my book, and I'm studying hate speech and fake news at the moment, I would like to take issue with the idea that spreading hate speech actually falls under your freedom of expression. And so for me, there is a tension there. I think that we need to be far, far quicker and sharper when major media houses, broadcasting and publications are actually spewing the same hate speech as politicians with very, very right-wing and authoritarian agendas. That to me is as big a threat to media freedom as people being put in jail. 
So I'm going to end on that note, saying that I think it is in within the media's grasp and for the media itself also to take stock. It is a battle within the media. And there's a there's been the wonderful work of Sevanti Nain and Gita Sheshu in India over the last 10 years in, in um, a website called The Hub, tracking and tracing the kind of intimidation, but also the kind of co-optation that's been happening in the journalism sphere. We should be thinking along those lines. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for underlying the questions of, of compulsion, but also complicity uh, that, are, that are taking place and, and adding uh, greater detail. Uh, Kayuri, if I could ask you, please, um, how does this compare uh, in terms of scenarios of trends um, uh, to your own country, uh, to Nigeria, but also across the wider Africa region? Thank you very much, uh, Sue. And uh, I also want to thank the previous uh, two speakers, uh, Sanjoy and uh, Shakun Tala. I hope I pronounced that, uh, you know, well. Um, you might as well describe, uh, you know, your country's uh, Nigeria or, you know, even Africa, because all that uh, you both uh, described uh, also what we face, uh, you know, in Africa. I mean, as a Nigerian uh, myself, uh, who is a publisher of a pan-African uh, uh, title for the whole of the continent and uh, circulates all around the world. We, uh, actually, had, I have the same problem that Sanjoy has, uh, you know, described in his uh, presentation. How we are going to get the next issue of Africa Today into the market is it, a big headache for me, you know, at the moment because for the past three months now, since this COVID-19 uh, uh, started, we have not been able, um, you know, to print. No printer will print us. No um, stores will uh, take the magazine. You know, the, the aircrafts are not uh, flying. We have about 99 countries in the world, you know, where we uh, distribute. Uh, nobody is working. And uh, we have to start uh, every day, you know, I sit and see, you know, how we are going to get, uh, you know, the next business because I've, by next year, I will be celebrating my 45th year in the profession in the newsroom. Every day for the for 45 years I've been in the newsroom and uh, before becoming a, 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 a publisher. I haven't seen a challenge. You, you know, as bad as this. The nearest one to this was during the Gulf War. You, you know, um, the big advertisers, particularly the oil companies uh, that have uh, uh, operations in Africa, when it comes to an issue of uh, war, they don't want their names to be attached uh, to a war situation. And when uh, the Iraq you know, first war was coming and the second uh, war was coming. We were getting calls from uh, ExxonMobil, getting calls from Shell to say that, well, the way this discussion is going, there might be war, but they're just warning us in advance that if there was war, uh, they were sorry, they will have to pull out the adverts that they had booked across the year, you, you know. So, and in those two wars, in those two worlds, that actually happened. And you can imagine a publisher publishing for Africa from London, uh, you know, how terrible that kind of situation, uh, you know, is. And uh, I believe that uh, my, 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 my uh, uh, compatriots in Africa and counterparts in Africa face the same similar uh, situation, uh, you know, locally there that it is very difficult, especially for some of us, you know, who had been at the forefront of campaigning uh, for press freedom over, you know, many uh, years. Go back to what Sue said earlier on. This is a generational thing. From one generation to the other, you have different challenges and you have to confront those challenges. In my own time, um, as a reporter in Nigeria and as an editor as well, it was military rule you know, that was the challenge, you know, at that time. And we had our newspapers closed. We had, um, you know, uh, 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 in my own case, I, I survived uh, assassination by a whisker, but my editor couldn't survive, you know, by letter bomb, uh, you know, attack. That was under military rule. 
now we have uh, uh, the civilian you know, democracy that we fought for. <laughs> you know, we, we, we did what we did against the military so that we could have democracy. And now we have democracy, the politicians, uh, the beneficiary of what we fought for. Some of them were nowhere to be found when we were fighting the soldiers. Now they are the ones in parliament. And rather than uh, supporting us, you know, in campaigning uh, for uh, press freedom, uh, you know, they prefer, uh, you know, to enjoy themselves uh, in parliament and get the fantastic pay that we are getting. But you are right, uh, you know, San Kutala, uh, because our colleagues, I'm sorry to say, also, you know, work hand in hand with these politicians. It's, mm. it's so bad that uh, when you open your newspapers in the morning, you do not know which story is genuine and which one is paid for. Mm. You see, I mean, uh, you know, and when you have a problem, when a journalist is arrested and they are coming to us in the CJA, for instance, you know, and other organizations around the world to fight for their release. You know, we look at the situation ourselves closely and we see that there is a, something like a blackmail involved in this. So how do you go out and defend such you know, a journalist? We are seeing that uh, you know, presently and it takes me to the issue of uh, the division that we now have in uh, uh, publishing. When we have local publishers and we have publishing at the national uh, you know, level. And a, a lot of these local publishers are online and they have brought in new challenges uh, you know, to us because they cannot be monitored. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very serious uh, you know, issue. In this COVID-19 situation, the authorities have used um, the, the lockdown as an excuse you know, to arrest, intimidate, um, flogging and beating, confiscating equipments of our, of our, of our colleagues. Uh, I want to leave it, um, you know, uh, as that, you know, for now, because there could be uh, a suggestion of what we can do uh, to solve this problem. Aida, thank you very much indeed for drawing the similarities, but also the, the important particular differences that, that, that you confront as a, as a long-standing editor, but also in the particular situation in Nigeria and its own unique history, and also the extent to which that politicians in opposition are keen for media freedom, which they then seem to lose the appetite for, for such uh, oversight and transparency once they are in power. Um, if I might ask um, Mrs. Rita Payne, uh, Rita, could I ask you to, to come in with your initial remarks um, before I open it up to a discussion between the three of you? If, if you could unmute, unmute your mic, please, Rita. Thank you. Can you Thank hear you me? Yeah. I can indeed. Excellent. Well, let me start by thanking um, Press Murphy and uh, Dr. Sue Onslow for taking this initiative, which is really important at such a critical time for us all and for the media. And this is really a time when it is a life and death situation. Um, this pandemic is something that no one has experienced. And this is a time when we should all be working together to look for solutions. Um, I was looking at figures this morning and what is quite alarming is that uh, the index on censorship, for example, was saying that as we mark 50 days since we started collating attacks on media freedom related to the coronavirus crisis, we're horrified by the number of attacks we have mapped, over 150 in what is ultimately a short period of time. And it says we know that in times of crisis, media attacks often increase. And this has become even uh, more apparent uh, following the pandemic. And as um, the editor-in-chief of Index on Censorship, Rachel Jolly, says, we are alarmed at the ferocity of some of the attacks on media freedom we are seeing being unveiled. In some states, journalists are threatened with prison sentences for reporting on shortages of vital hospital equipment. The public need to know this kind of life-saving information, not have it kept from them which is that our report is highlighting that governments around the world are tempted to use different tactics 
to stop the public knowing what they need to know. Now, what is already heartening is, although this might look grim, it is quite upsetting to see what's happening, we have already heard from three independent, eminent journalists in their region, from Sanjoy, Shakuntala, and Kayode. And that sort of also makes us feel that instead of wringing one's hands, we've got to use what tools we have, what opportunities we can take to try and fight back, to counter this disinformation. As Sonjo said, economy, shrinking resources are key. Media houses, the collaboration, and as Shakuntala said, what is even worrying and disappointing is journalists who are collaborating with the government in spreading misinformation. The, uh, what is uh, very um, upsetting and alarming in India is how you know, um, the government, Mr. Modi's government, is using uh, the pandemic to try and say that Muslims are responsible for spreading the virus. And I, I agree with what Sonjoy said, is that what fact checking, checking the sources of everything as journalists that we share, we've got to check. It's sort of click, check before you click, I think should be the motto for us. Now I will come on to um, the initiative which was taken by the Commonwealth Journalists Association in collaboration with other Commonwealth associations. And before um, I start my remarks and telling you more about the media principles, I'd like to uh, talk about two colleagues, mention two colleagues, uh, William Horsley and David Page, who have really done uh, most of the work on uh, drawing up principles on good governance and the media. Um, so what happened is that um, with the clamor and the concern about the attacks on journalists, um, this is even before the pandemic, in 2016, uh, the Commonwealth Journalists Association had a conference. And in response to the calls for some action to be taken, um, the CJA, in collaboration with um, other work, formed a working group, and this included represented figures from six Commonwealth professional organizations, the Commonwealth Journalists Association, Lawyers Association, the Commonwealth Legal Education Association, the Parliamentary Association of the UK, the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, and Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. And this in, in 2018, the a set of media principles was launched. And they are currently in discussion with the Commonwealth Secretariat and a number of states seeking to build a consensus in favor of the eventual adoption of these principles as a universal code for the Commonwealth to protect both freedom of expression and the activities of responsible journalists. Now, um, I don't want to go on for too long, but what I will say, this is hopeful, but what is disappointing is that although the Commonwealth and the Charter, and we've already heard, there has pledged to uphold medium freedom of expression, the governments uh, and the Secretariat have been, that haven't been that forthcoming and positive in promoting and pushing these. And some of the problems are built in. For example, the Secretariat is seen to be representing heads of government, they don't want to be seen to be finger wagging. So the question now is what can we do? Uh, we've already made a start, the media and governance principles, um, they are being um, taken up by um, you know, a high level committee, a review body, including Amal Clooney and various eminent figures. And we're also working closely with the UN Partnership on the Safety of Journalists, or the UN Coalition. So um, actions are being taken uh, to try and promote, to fight back. Um, but the problem is now is the how do we get Commonwealth governments to be more proactive and taking this whole issue seriously? So we've got the, the launch of the Global Media Coalition in UK and Canada in July 2019 represents an important opportunity for Commonwealth member states to respond to the urgency of these issues. They can do so by reforming national laws and practices so as to establish a favorable environment for media freedom and by showing themselves willing to be part of the coalition of states whose goal is to reverse the global trend towards suppression 
of free and independent media through violence and repressive laws. And so this is where I'll end. And um, it is an opportunity, I will mention again later on, how critical it is the important time media freedom is when we all need to know exactly what is happening with the pandemic, how we can protect ourselves and inform the public. Um, thank you very much indeed, Rita, for that very sobering uh, summary, pointing to uh, uh, current statistics of pressures, but also to highlighting the various areas in which Commonwealth institutions, be it at intergovernmental level, but also at civil society level, are seeking to provide benchmarks and to, to take um, positive action, uh, which can be built upon so that it doesn't sit simply in the realm of declarations and uh, um, sitting in, well, I suppose the, the terrain of process, but actually has meaningful outcomes. Um, if I might, uh, um, thinking more laterally about uh, where there are possibilities for Commonwealth coordinated activity. Uh, Shukundali, if I, if I could ask you, please, if you could reflect, uh, building upon your research that I know that you're doing at the moment on WhatsApp, um, uh, it's um, investigation on the, 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 the interaction between um, intimidation on WhatsApp and lynchings, uh, that, that, um, if you can reflect in a broader way on could the Commonwealth in any way collaborate, do you feel, in addressing the tech companies and their responsibilities? Because it seems that otherwise that we're operating in completely different silos and we need to think about this, the, the new terrain of which new media, social media, of course, is so important. I think that's a great question, Sue, um, but I'd like to flip it on its head and um, respond to one of the questions also asked um, in the chat box around whether mm -hmm. we should have governmental regulation or self-regulation. Yes, I think the answer to that is that we're actually in a catch-22 situation with regulation where you have many of the worst abuses of journalistic freedom and of media freedom coming from governments. It, it, it seems almost perverse to call on those same governments to regulate the media which they are already censoring and where they are already putting in paid news. Therefore, what one would have to ask for would be some kind of a public, private, international body in every single country in which the Commonwealth could play some kind of role to regulate media in all of these countries. And that would have to come with some kind of punitive measures because actually at the moment when you're talking about threats to life, threats to livelihoods, and threats to neighborhoods, which where you've seen entire neighborhoods burnt down, you've seen pogroms taking place, you've seen governments perpetuating this, journalists being shot in the face when they try to report on these kinds of things. I don't think it's good enough to just say self-regulation. Although that is an ideal, that's an ideal in a world where everyone understands ethics and democracy in the same way. And that is clearly not what is happening across the Commonwealth countries at the moment, not even what's happening in non-Commonwealth countries at the moment. Clearly, mm -hmm. there is an attempt to erode the very standards on which basic journalist integrity stands. Mm -hmm. And that happens in multiple ways, as we've heard from all our colleagues. And I think it's not good enough to just say, um, we'll have a rule, we'll have a set of principles without saying what will happen if we follow through. So I take it back to your question about the tech companies. I would mm -hmm. say the same thing about tech companies, which is that they need, we need to hit them where it hurts. If they are not taking seriously issues of hate speech and, and misogyny and child trafficking and porn on their sites, which are circulating clearly on a daily basis on WhatsApp, but even openly on Facebook, despite the many checkers and balances that there are within these systems, I think that people need to take their, take their profiles down, move away from these, um, these platforms. The problem is many people are misinformed and won't do that and they participate in misinformation. I've just sent a link to our report on WhatsApp misinformation and one of the key findings of that was that highly digitally literate people, highly politically literate people who know what they're doing are spreading disinformation. They, some of them are ex-journalists who have now become paid and work for governments, and they do so under the radar. And it, they're quite happy to undermine trust. And I think trust is a word we haven't talked about enough today. They undermine trust in all media so that it's easy for people to say, oh, well, this journalist reporting on COVID is spreading misinformation when they're actually telling the truth. So that it's very difficult for people to pick and choose. And so the tech companies are no more or less 
uh, complicit in the situation than many big media houses than governments in the region. And therefore, regulators need to be drawn from all of these spheres, from the civil society, from human rights organizations, and they need to be cross-cutting across countries so that they can't be accused of why are you just picking on us and why are you not picking on them. And the Commonwealth, I think, could have a massive basis for um, helping, supporting and initiating something like that. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Coyote, if I could uh, just build on those remarks, in view of what Ashokundal has pointed out of this question, of it's, it's no good looking to self-regulation. In, in terms of, of your knowledge of your particular region, how much do you think that if the Commonwealth was to, say, sign up to the UNESCO protocols around safety of journalists, after all, these are established international protocols, which have um, effective uh, careful regulations, supporting guidelines or, around um, appropriate media reportage, etc. Do you feel that this would be an important step forward? Or, um, in fact, do you not regard this, in fact, as a, as a possible positive opportunity which could be pursued? There is no amount of protocol that uh, we can bring out without having support of governments. Mm. You see, government is very key in all these things that, uh, you know, we are talking about. You know, a good government uh, will allow freedom of uh, expression, freedom of uh, speech, and, uh, you know, freedom of the press in a lot of countries. In fact, in all these countries, these uh, enshrined in the constitution is only that they close their eyes, you know, against, you know, these uh, provisions in the constitution and just do what they like. As we speak, as far as uh, this COVID-19 issue is, with the security uh, services and the intelligence uh, agencies using it as a pretext to uh, put pressure on journalists, there are several Commonwealth countries where we have been affected by this, starting from my own Nigeria, Rwanda, where we are going for the next uh, program, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Uganda, where journalists have been assaulted, the, you know, covering COVID-19, Sierra Leone, Ghana. In Zambia, they had a license, uh, a broadcasting license of uh, one of the radio stations there was seized as a result of this. So um, we have to put pressure on government. And I look at our um, associations, the NGOs within the, the Commonwealth. I could look at about three of our, of our associations that the Commonwealth Journalist Associations could collaborate with. First of all, the lawyers, you know, association, mm -hmm. because we need them when it comes to uh, defending our colleagues in court. We need to work very closely, you know, with them. We have some of these institutions already, you know, within our Commonwealth Associations. The next, two, the next one, sorry, is the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. That is where all these politicians come to, you know, well-dressed, you know, with their flowing gowns, uh, creating the impression as though everything at home is good, you know. So we need to work with the Commonwealth uh, Parliamentary Association and then the Commonwealth Local Government, you know, forum. Mm -hmm. Also, we need to work closely, you know, with them. And then most importantly, the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. You know, if all these ones that I have mentioned together, you know, with the uh, CJA can team up in trying to find a way, you know, of uh, uh, supporting journalists when they are in, uh, you know, trouble and putting a forceful case again, you know, before the heads of government. We have been trying to put these uh, principles before heads of government for, as far as I know, over 30 years. Mm -hmm. You know, the late uh, Derek Ingram was at the forefront you know, of this, but they never listened. I could remember, I mean, the, the Chogam in uh, Harare, you know, when uh, 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 Derek, you know, was like running after, you know, each uh, heads of state. The only thing we got at the, at, at the end of the day was a single line in their communique to say that they support press freedom, you know? So I think we bring it back home. It is high time um, the Commonwealth associations that I have mentioned, Maybe they should have a meeting together and see how we can work together and confront these heads, you know, directly in one of their conferences. 
thank you very much indeed, Koedu, for that call to arms of uh, if leading professional Commonwealth civil society organizations, that they should form, in a way, a Commonwealth mirror to the Samden network that, that uh, Sanjoy, of course, has worked so hard uh, to put together and which forms that critical solidarity and, and effective collaboration um, ac across Commonwealth civil society networks. Um, Rita, if I could ask you, please, as a, as a veteran journalist, uh, picking up on comments that Shukuntula and, and Coyote had made um, about this question of complicity and compliance, uh, what, how far do you think that uh, Amal Clooney's high-level legal group's review and their report on targeted sanctions against, it could be said, miscreant governments has effectively been, uh, shall we say, undercut by the COVID-19 pandemic? In other, after all, that report, which was launched at Chatham House in February of this year, um, seems to have completely dropped off the table. Uh, it, it made a cogent and detailed argument for how uh, there were different measurements and targeted sanctions to support journalists in terms of visa regimes, etc. But in view of the accelerating economic challenges facing governments, to what extent do you think it is indeed plausible or uh, that governments will, it, will address this? and that there will be the necessary political will to collaborate to impose and implement targeted sanctions. As you say, Sue, it is extremely challenging. There's very little incentive for governments to collaborate, cooperate. Um, we will have to see how effective this body will be and how we we'll listen to them, whether we can get this high-level review body uh, to be heard at the UN, for action, but it, it it is a challenge, and we can only hope uh, that there will be a response. We all have a part to play, us journalists and journalist organisations, to promote and push uh, and put pressure. But ultimately, what makes governments, those in power, react and respond? Um, you know, there are certain. Why, as I think uh, maybe Sandra said, you've got to hit them or Shakuntala. You've got to hit them where it hurts, which is the economy. Somehow, uh, it's going to be a big uphill climb to somehow make the governments feel that transparency, media freedom is good for democracy, good for their image, yeah. good for them to be seen as transparent and open and not hiding anything. I mean, look at the shining example of New Zealand. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems that New Zealand can't do any wrong. Why can't other Commonwealth countries follow that lead? And I think that so we have to look at examples where, in Commonwealth countries, where it's working, where the media is free. We're looking at Namibia. You know, we're looking at, we must learn from success stories and maybe highlight and maybe find a way of praising governments which do take positive measures, initiatives, which are responsible. So maybe not just pointing a finger, but also highlighting examples of good practice. Mm. Um, Shukundal, if I could pick up on that question of examples of good practice, to what extent do you feel that the right to information uh, legislation in Sri Lanka, in fact, offers a model of good practice that could be emulated across the, the wider South Asian region and that it, it does provide, if you like, important um, legislative forms and entitlement to of access to information, those new op those opportunities that, that Sanjoy emphasized at the start, the journalists themselves culturally need to think differently about their about their their profession. I think that's absolutely right, Sue, and I agree totally with Rita that one has to also point out what are our good practices. And I think the right to information in India and Sri Lanka have been unbelievably helpful to civil society organizations in pointing out various abuses of power, false news and fake narratives coming out of government. However, you've got to see the tension here between re regimes which are becoming more and more authoritarian and don't want to share th that kind of information and the watering down of these laws and acts which have been fought for over many, many years. So two decades of work by human rights and civil rights organizations in India and Sri Lanka to get those kinds of right to information acts passed, but then they so easily repealed. And so what needs to happen is that they, we need to be supported from outside. Each of these countries needs to have those good practices supported and, and shown very, very publicly as good practice. It's, it's increasingly the case, and it appears to be 
that India and the US are leading the way in this, that governments don't seem to be shameable. They don't feel ashamed of having their misdeeds put in public because they feel they can just give, um, they, they have in fact co-opted the term fake news and turned it on journalists who use integrity to report on what they're doing. And so the problem with countries which where you can't shame them is that they need to get something good out of having right to information acts and out of providing that information through the courts when they are required to do so rather than fighting it at every step, which is what's happening currently. So it mm -hmm. might seem an easy thing to get information in Sri Lanka. It actually isn't at all. It requires people, you know, you'd, you'd have thought it was like, you know, you put in, you have this right. It's something you can take. Not at all. People are on a daily basis. Journalists on a daily basis are, are fighting to get the information that should be that right. So I think we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't see it as an end point. We should see it as an ongoing going struggle mm. for transparency. Mm. 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 Thank you very much. Coyote, in terms of, of your detailed knowledge of, of your continent, um, how much do you see Ghana um, having brought in right to information uh, legislation as a leading light that uh, could um, act as, a, as, as a, champ, a regional champion, as a standard bearer, validating the importance of this legislation and underpinning, in fact, the value to governance of, um, of such legislation? With due respect to Ghana, they are coming behind Nigeria. And uh, we've done this, and it's over there for any journalist to go and use, if they want to use the Freedom of Information uh, mm -hmm. you know, Act. I mean, it's not just Nigeria or Ghana. I'm sure maybe some other African Commonwealth uh, you know, countries you know, also you know, have, have, have this. But mm -hmm. as I said earlier on, um, it can be used uh, when it favors them, when it favors the government. The politicians, yes. you know, to, 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 to use the act. Mm. If, they, if it is not in their favor, they do everything to frustrate, you know. You will just see that the, the file in the ministry that houses the act it just disappears. These are the kind of things that we see and we live with every day, you know. Yes. But um, I will say that, um, you know, you said something earlier on, which actually... I didn't know exist in the UK. Um, the UK having a special envoy on media freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, I mm -hmm. think uh, in terms of what we are trying to do, getting um, Commonwealth associations to work together, um, mm -hmm. it is something that we could try to, I say this, uh, you, you know, guardedly, encourage, you know, the heads to adopt, you know, having a special envoy on media freedom in government, you know, so that at least we professionals in our different countries, instead of just uh, fighting, uh, not uh, having someone to deal with directly, we have an envoy mm -hmm. that we can hold responsible, that we can talk to, that mm -hmm. we can walk to his office, mm -hmm. you, you know, and put all these challenges that we are facing on the table and ask him to meet the prime minister, to meet the president, you know, and let, if he doesn't know him, let him know what we are going through. I think that would be one suggestion that I would want to, uh, you know, put on the table. Uh, Coyote, thank you very much for that. You, you refer, in fact, I think, to, you're, you're drawing upon arguments that um, Richard Bourne had made in the CHRI for pressing for a Commonwealth Human Rights Commissioner, which of course featured also in the Eminent Persons Report of 2011. And in fact, I put that into my uh, written submission to the Foreign Affairs Committee inquiry into the UK's uh, current strategic review, um, arguing that there needs to be an effective Commonwealth envoy representing human rights across the board to underpin the values articulated in the charter. So um, I'm afraid I think this battle will run for a while and um, it will run and run. Uh, but I, my argument was that I saw, in fact, a recalibration of the role of the Secretary General to be the Commonwealth Human Rights Commissioner to speak for Commonwealth peoples rather than, it should be said, a political role to articulate and collaborate uh, to establish consensus uh, through the inter primarily through the intergovernmental organization. I know that there are those who say that, in fact, Patricia Scotland's role serves both. But I think that what we, we are seeing here, particularly on the issue of uh, media freedom, are tensions that exist um, 
between governments and societies and within societies. Shakuntala made reference to the question of social media, marginalizing and excluding um, uh, particular minorities or, or indigenous communities. Um, but so that there need to be different forms and structures, different networks of collaboration. And I, personally, I see a Commonwealth Human Rights Commissioner as a very important addition to that, to effective implementation. Can I add something? Mm -hmm. Please. Mm -hmm. um, it is about training of journalists, which no one has spoken you know, mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, when I started my own career 45 years ago, I started as a cop reporter from school no university degree. I went straight into the newsroom and I was trained in the newsroom and I grew through the ladder. Newspapers of old, they had that tradition of spending money on their reporters, training them, sending some of them to Fleet Street, you know, to come in as an intern in some of the newspapers in Fleet Street, because we are talking about issue of uh, ethics and uh, credibility. And that is the big problem that we have now you know, in uh, uh, most developing Commonwealth, you know, countries. In the past, uh, uh, you know, few years now, we haven't had that kind of support for training that journalists in the Commonwealth used to have. Um, coming from uh, Commonwealth uh, Press Union of old, you know, for, for, for example, we've lost all that. There are some of our old colleagues who came in from Canada and some other places working, you know, in the, in the newsroom in uh, uh, you know, Fleet Street, who came in as an intern as, uh, uh, you know, at, at that time. I think we should also uh, appeal to the Commonwealth Secretariat or the Secretary General to look at this issue you know, for us, so that we, we, we need the Commonwealth support for the training of journalists across board in the Commonwealth. The, the issue there, of course, Coyote, is diminishing uh, resources directed to the Secretariat and also the um, other institutions have, to, have taken on areas of responsibility of training. I was looking this morning at UNESCO's platform on their safety of journalists uh, program, um, offering training for journalists uh, and also for national security uh, forces and for the judiciary. Um, of course, Reporters Without Borders is, is one of the leaders, but there are, there are a multiplicity of other organizations that offer training for journalists. But I agree with you that there isn't a separate Commonwealth provision of this to help to underpin the, the importance of cross-Commonwealth learning and structures and networks of support. I, I agree, agree with you that. Colleagues, um, if I may, um, the question that Shukuntala picked up on about uh, self-regulation um, or self-compliance, which was one of the first questions in the chat line. Rita, do you want to, to add any comment on that? Because it was one of the questions from the floor. Do you have a particular view? Do, um, Shukuntala, as I say, addressed it earlier in her remarks, but do you want to reflect on that? Rita, I'm sorry, you're going to have to unmute your mic. About that, yeah. Okay, no, I, I was in fact going to ask Shakuntala to you know, uh, tell us a bit more about ideas and how this would work, because I think regulation, self-regulation, I mean, I veered with my BBC background um, more towards going for self-regulation in this context, which would work. But uh, from what Chakuntala said, that this given, especially the, what's happening in India, this might not work. So, um, yes, I don't have a clear idea. I still like the thought of self-regulation. I would like the thought of an independent body, uh, which would comprise uh, representatives who would have an interest from every sphere, whether it's journalists, media, law. Um, that's all I can say at the moment, because um, obviously there is a big call, especially with the tech companies, what do you do to regulate the spread of disinformation? And one has to be so careful to sort of go for some sort of regulation, because it seems useful to close down one area of problems, but you might start locking down other areas of media freedom. So yeah, I wish I could say something more positive. All I can say, yes, I still am keen on self-regulation, but I would be interested in knowing more about how this can be organized in an effective way. Um, thank you. I mean, it's not that I'm not keen on self-regulation. I, I think there's, there's nobody who would say that as an ideal, self-regulation isn't where we'd like to be. But in an era where more and more 
um, media houses have been bought and paid for by government or are completely under government command because they're so frightened. And again, I, I don't want to make light of this. It's not an easy decision for someone who's been an independent editor for many, many years to suddenly buckle. But people's families are being threatened. Their livelihoods are being threatened. Um, literally everything about them is being cut from under their feet and they do buckle. They buckle to that kind of pressure. So I want to ask you the question, what does self-regulation mean in a world where even, even institutions like the BBC are complicit in government disinformation? What does self-regulation mean? And I think in the UK, just a, not a very many years back, we just had a commission looking at the absolutely appalling practices of the press in terms of tapping people's phones, illegally gathering information, and publicizing, perhaps if you look at the history of headlines of the Daily Mail, hate speech, which did ultimately result in the murders of people of color in the UK. And if you look at the US, this is, this is absolutely evident there. So coming back to the Commonwealth in India, and if you look at our report on, on WhatsApp and misinformation, it's very clear that broadcast media houses have been complicit in calling for the death and the murders of people who are dissenters from the government. What does self-regulation mean in that context? And so therefore, I want a regulator which has some teeth. There is absolutely no point having a regulator which is entirely complicit because then it's not doing its job of regulating. But equally, going to the other end of the spectrum, you don't want a regulator who comes entirely from the government and is therefore um, simply carrying out further the censorship regime of any particular government, whether that be in the Commonwealth or the US or Russia or the UK. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be really, really clear here that the only way forward would be for independent journalist organizations from across the world to come together and think of ways of constituting these boards of governance and regulation in places like India and places like South Africa, which have some common members, but also some individual members from those countries, which draw from civil society, from editors' guilds, from working journalists, from independent journalists, from the public, you know, and the public, obviously, people who have worked on issues of journalists and media freedom, and that these would come with some backing from the multiple governments in the Commonwealth, that they would come with some backing for some form of sanction. I, and I'm not, not keen on economic sanctions which hit, hit populations, but some form of sanction against those governments if they were not to comply and if the media houses were not to comply. It would, for example, actually really double down on hate speech, which is now prevalent in Indian media against Muslims, on hate speech, which is prevalent in some Pakistani and Bangladeshi media against atheists, and so on and so forth. So I think we need to be very clear that a regulator has to be cross-body, cross-party, and have some teeth. Just picking up on your, on your point of sanctions, of course, uh, the eminent person's a uh, report of 2011 expressly argued that the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group, which after all is the oversight body in terms of governments, governance across the Commonwealth, should have media freedom of expression as one of its benchmarks of potential serious uh, violations of those, those standards. So um, it's possible then that uh, the Commonwealth has the potentiality for this, but this is the constant complaint about the Commonwealth that its, its potential is, is so so often not realized. Code is, um, as a, a veteran Commonwealth observer, what would you say to, to this, uh, this discussion? Well, and this particular point? We, 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 we cannot stop talking about uh, this issue. Mm -hmm. um, it is an issue personally that I have lived with since uh, I started associating you know, with the Commonwealth and I have passion, passion for it. You mm -hmm. know, because I've done nothing else in my life than being a newspaper person, mm -hmm. and uh, I fought governments, military, you, you, you know, in, in in Nigeria with my colleagues, uh, you know, over there successfully. Governments uh, are always very embarrassed, you know, when you expose them, even with the tiniest uh, columns in newspapers about their, you know, shall I say, bad or evil, uh, you know, deeds. So. I believe that uh, if we, if the Commonwealth, uh, is this eminence persons group that you, you, you mentioned uh, had this already on their agenda, they should be reminded 
they should dust the document up. I mean, we should remind them, you know, maybe this school, this, this school help us to achieve what we are trying to achieve, uh, you know, presently. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Colleagues, if I could um, just bring in questions from uh, from the chat line, in addition to the, the question of self-regulation, there is a, a, um, a question from my colleague um, uh, Banula Chandra uh, at uh, the ICWS, who asks whether you see a place for a fact-checking organization organized by the Commonwealth, or do you think that this would be in fact, a, uh, should we say, a duplication of regional and national fact-checking organizations which already exist. Uh, Shakuntala, your, your remarks, can please. I, can I respond to that? Um, I, think, I think actually it's a very, very good suggestion, but again, the constitution of that fact-checking organization would have to be very carefully considered and put together. Um, I've studied lots of fact-checkers across India. Some fact-checkers have been put in place by paid media and by government themselves to undermine other fact-checkers. There's a war of fact-checkers going on across the subcontinent. This is the case in Sri Lanka as well, and I'm certain it's also the case in parts of Latin America and Africa. So where you have a war of fact checkers, again, you know, when someone says, I fact check this, you have to look at where the ideology and the money comes from in terms of that organization. I think it would be a very good idea to have a cross national fact checker, because we could do two things in that case, you mm -hmm. could then actually give a stamp of approval to certain fact checkers and to, and, and say and reveal others to be what they actually are, government, another government arm of propaganda, number one. And two, one would also be able to see where misinformation and disinformation is cross-national and is just morphing in one country to target one particular group of people who are the other in that country and in another country. So for instance, the same disinformation, which has been used in Myanmar against Rohingyas, has been used in India in the Northeast against so-called Bangladeshi infiltrators, has been used in Pakistan, in parts of Pakistan against certain groups of people. The exact same story Stories, which are being picked up by mainstream media and spread completely with no um, no filter and therefore fact checkers coming together having a conglomerate fact checker which did this kind of fact checking would be super helpful especially in cases of a pandemic like COVID but equally in relation to hate speech and I think um, that is something which can't be denied but the constitution of that fact checking organization would have to be one which was not seen as suspect it would not it would have to be ideologically very much um, non-aligned in the manner of the sort of 1970s non-aligned movement. Mm, I wonder in these polarized times if that is indeed possible, but I think that it is certainly an important, uh, shall we say, agenda that we should put on our, on our, on our list. Uh, Rita, your comments, please, uh, on, on that suggestion. I think that's excellent. I really, um, I think what Shakuntala is saying is to have cross-national people who are respected, have been checked, and, you know, everyone knows what their positions are. They have a standing in their countries and internationally. It's a matter of who will fund it, who will organize it. Um, that's the issue. Um, I wonder if this could be something that we could approach, for example, the Foreign Office, uh, which has got this, you know, Media Defenders Fund, whether if we thought up of a practical, a solid solution, this is something that we might be able to... Mm -hmm to push for mm. and also picking up on on the fact that there are regional examples of good practice whether in fact that this could be directed rather than at a pan commonwealth approach actually focus more on the regions and the regional organizations within the commonwealth thinking after all in the, the way that there are that the commonwealth has porous boundaries in that it operates, uh, groups of Commonwealth countries operate in wider regional economic um, uh, communities. And so that in that way, Commonwealth good practice could disseminate a, in, a, in a wider sphere. Although, of course, that would lose the benefit of having a Commonwealth branding to it. Uh, because so often the Commonwealth slips below the, the visibility. Um, oh, Rita, you've disappeared. I don't know. No, my battery is going down fast. <laughs> I think... Uh, uh, you know, a two-tier approach mm -hmm. is, is needed very much. And I think um, the Commonwealth with, you know, as we're always told, you know, common language, common laws, we ha and you've also mentioned, there's a lot about potential, mm -hmm. but it's not achieved, it's not followed up. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And um, the summit would have been an opportunity when we were hoping that, say, for example, the media and governance principles would have been taken up. Because this is really right at the bottom, we're starting at stage one to try and encourage, disseminate ideas and so on. Um, but I think at the end, uh, you know, the ideas that we've discussed so far, the one that seems most attractive to me is whether the Commonwealth can set up somebody for all these, act. take the lead, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's something that the ICWS can do. Oh, and also the fact that after all, the UK is still chair in office until the next exactly. uh, Commonwealth heads meeting, which is going to be held at some point next year. And yeah. so, it, it, and it does have the Global Media Fund. It does have the Global Media a campaign of which I believe only six Commonwealth countries have signed. I think there needs to be a push yeah. there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, th yes, to draw upon, after all, the fusion of DFID and the, and the FCO and see if we can get some developmental money <laughs> directed towards, as you say, um, a Commonwealth um, institution that would be of material benefit in terms of underpinning um, reliable news. I'd also the, counter what people usually ask, is what is the Commonwealth um, for? What does it stand for? This will be an answer. Thank you. Indeed, indeed, indeed. I'm just looking quickly. Um, I don't see any additional questions. Uh, we've asked about self-regulation, compliance, uh, a Commonwealth um, fact-checking organization. Um, then if I had colleagues, because uh, we have until really half past, um, half past 11 uh, thereabouts uh, to continue this discussion, as I start to draw this, uh, this debate then to a close. Um, do you, uh, how optimistic, well, okay, I'm obviously you're, you're, you feel that there are areas where there are possibilities and opportunities, although you are realistic at uh, the, the enormous challenges that we are confronted by, um, uh, the economic challenges, which of course directly impinge upon financial flows um, and, and the media landscape. Um, government manipulation and exploitation of the of the pandemic to to embed authoritarian practices, failing to appreciate that the public health needs of free flows of information um, at such a time of a, uh, the crisis of the pandemic. But um, in terms of the modern Commonwealth as a multilateral organisation. Clearly, we've identified different areas of intergovernmental possibility and also civil society activism, which, as we know, doesn't rely solely on financial uh, flows, although, of course, it needs them. But it also draws upon the ideal of the Commonwealth in terms of people's commitment and their various and drawing together their various areas of expertise. Where do you see particularly that there are possibilities of drawing upon the, the greatest potential within the Commonwealth societies of youth and women? I mean, we've, we've looked at it, the Commonwealth, in those various silos of intergovernmental civil society. But are there different particular constituencies that could be mobilized uh, in terms of media freedom? Or is that, in fact, a flawed way to look at how we could create and sustain different opportunities and different areas of activity to underpin freedom of expression? Or is that too big a question? Rita? Yeah, I was saying, um, I think what uh, Coyote spoke about, which is training, and I think mm -hmm. especially with youth, mm -hmm. I think, again, this could be something that the Commonwealth might be able to do, is train young journalists, mm -hmm. um, you know, in sort of good practice, talk about facts and everything that we value basically good professional journalism high standards and uh, which um, again I'll go back I know that Chakuntala is cynical about what's happened in BBC now but when I did start way back in the late 70s I mean that's really sort of embedded in me in you know giving information entertaining but unbiased factual and let people decide for themselves. So I think, as you say, working with the younger generation is where we should focus now. I mean, I don't always go for looking at women specifically as different. I think, you know, in this panel here, this meeting here, it doesn't stop really relevant whether they're women or men. So, but I, but I think that looking at youth is really the way forward. Um, colleagues, uh, Shakuntala and Coyote, what do you feel about... Well, should I come in there? Please I mean, do. Please do. Look, I look at 
and I was listening to all the discussion about fact checker, and I'm wondering if I'm in the right place. You know, I'm a living example. I went into the newsroom at the age of 18, 18, and I was taught what is news and what is not news, how to get news. You know, above me, you have a news editor. It's not just a news editor by title. It's an experienced, you know, editor, you know, editing the scripts that come from reporters from all over the country and around the world. And his duty is to do his facts checking. He will not pass that story, you, you know, to the sub editor's rooms, you know, without making sure that the facts are correct. And we always say that if you are in doubt, leave out. Yeah. That, we, every journalist knows that. So where is an external fact checker coming from? If you miss the news editor and you miss the sub editors, it goes to the editor of the title himself before the newspaper goes to bed. So it is training. Training is the key. Look at all the media today, including in Britain. You see new faces on television, young new, new, new faces. Things have changed, you know, even over here in the UK. And it's going to happen all over the Commonwealth. Young people just leaving university without experience in journalism, going into the profession. They are the ones that we need to train. And they have to be under experienced editors who will do the facts, you know, checking. If we do it that way, we will always go back to how it used to be when newspapers are credible and ethics are, you know, priority. Coyote, do you believe that's possible given the seismic shift in access to news in social media platforms? After all, if you have the rise of the citizen journalist rather than the accredited journalist who has the ethics of journalism, the fact checking, I've discussed this with Rita many times. Now, this is, this is a new world. So it's, I don't believe it's possible to go back to that. Other. So how do you then incorporate effective, responsible fact checking with citizen journalism online? There have to be different, different ways, different means, different modes of reaching to try to underpin the bloggers, the vloggers, etc., to try to inculcate standards of checking and ethics, etc. But you haven't got that editorial oversight. It just isn't there. Well, look, the biggest problem we have are the bloggers and the, the new media, you know, mm -hmm. social, so, so social media. And that is where, it, it, it is new to every one of us, mm -hmm. you see? And that is where training, uh, you know, should go to. We underestimated the strength of the social media when it first started. And mm -hmm. we said, no, 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 you know, they are not serious. But everyone now takes them seriously. So if we are looking at them, we must go in there and train them so that what they are putting out are factual, not, 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 not fake news. But mm -hmm. in the old fashioned way of doing things, I relate as a publisher with a lot of editors across Africa and around the world. And most of the ones that I, I, I use, in fact, I have younger ones because we don't have uh, the, you know, time to train. We want mm -hmm. to go to press immediately. So we go to the old, um, you know, newspaper hacks, you know, who have experience all around the world, <laughs> you, you know, yes. so the veterans. So I want, I want to say that if you look around, if you search properly, they are still around, mm -hmm. you know, they are still around. Some of us can still point, uh, you, you know, direction to where they are, you know, but the younger ones have to tap from their fountain of experience, mm -hmm. you see, mm -hmm. Be, be, before this, I mean, they are in retirement, as uh, uh, Rita will know. Rita, Rita is a veteran, <laughs> you know, editor there. I'm sure a lot of young people will like to talk, you know, from Rita's experience and people like 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 like, like Rita. So it, it needs us organizing ourselves. Those two um, uh, sectors, the veterans, you know, who have experience, who have historical you know, experience about issues, who know individuals that we are reporting about, mm -hmm. who can pick up their telephones directly to speak, you know, with the person that we are reporting on and ask, is this, is, is this true? I have this on my desk. Is mm -hmm. this true? Mm -hmm. Some of the editors today can't do that because mm -hmm. they no longer have the, they don't have the contacts. They can't use the contacts. 
you know, that's where the senior editors and experienced editors, you know, will use to, you know, uh, check their facts. That mm -hmm. is the problem. And of mm -hmm. course, the, the reporters we are talking about don't have access, you know, to ministers. They don't have access to permanent secretaries. They block them, you mm -hmm. know, before they even get to that level. That is the practical experience that journalists, you know, are having, you mm -hmm. know. So, you know, let's, let's train the young ones and, uh, you know, the, the, the senior ones should be encouraged, you know, so to, to give us their wealth of experience. Mm. Um, and you also point to the um, how, in fact, and picking up on Rita's point, the, the possibility of educating youth, but it, it starts at a much lower level, uh, not when people are emerging from university and thinking about a career in journalism. It starts at it starts at primary school level. It starts at secondary school level. Let's face it, this, the, given the Internet literacy of so many young people across the Commonwealth, surely it should these ideas, values, fact checking, the importance of of trust and whether you trust indeed that the, the, the information that's coming through on your phone. Um, I think these these values, these ideals, these these um, practices of caution should need to be instilled at a much at a much younger age. But I'm gonna come in there soon. Please. I, I want to respond on several things, um, not, not to take issue next, necessarily, Coyote, with the, the sort of notion of the golden age of reporting when there was this, this you know, these, these really great beat reporters who made their way up under really great editors. But um, just sort of from my perspective, since I've had many, many colleagues and friends who've been journalists from that age in India, and, you know, there were times when things were better, but it was always an old boys club. And I'm going to be really clear about that. It was always very difficult to be a woman beat reporter. You had to do all kinds of things in India, which would make it incompatible mm -hmm. with having a home life, which made it very difficult when the in-laws didn't want you to be going to certain places or staying in the newsroom late at night. It was, it was uh, not, a, not an easy job. Um, and it was deliberately kept like that. It was it was something which was, you know, sort of a lot of sexual harassment of young reporters and of, of, of young women editors in the newsroom took place. And recently there were several cases brought against um, a, a, an, a, one of those old editors, MJ Akbar, who is now a member of the Indian ruling government um, by women that he has harassed over the years in the newsroom, in their role as interns, in their role as journalists. So just to be very clear, there is so much that can be done even yeah. within the old framework of journalism yeah. and responsible reporting where the editor um, knows and picks up the phone mm -hmm. and can speak to a minister. And I think there are two things to be said in response to the brilliant questions about um, citizen reporting and citizen journalism. The first is that those people are both used by and competition to the mainstream media houses. And I think there needs to be a much more, a much more nurturing relationship between the young people doing those kinds of quite dangerous jobs. There's, there's some brilliant work on the role of fixers in um, investigative journalism coming out around the world, particularly Iraq, Syria, and places like that, which I think the Commonwealth could learn from. Um, mm -hmm. The role of fixers is a complicated one. You might have someone who is actually a brilliant journalist, but doesn't get paid um, an editorial salary or a newsroom salary. And I think mm -hmm. those people take massive risks and they become the contact that your journalist who gets a salary phones and calls mm -hmm. when they need them, but then they don't have the protection of the news house. And I've talked extensively with people at Al Jazeera about this issue. They don't have the protection of the news house when it comes down to it. And they don't have either financial protection and they don't also have the protection of the name of being a journalist because they're only a fixer. And those are the young people that I think who could be trained. Those are both young men and women who could be kept much safer and given mm -hmm. many, many different roles. But this is a tension between the economic model of mm -hmm. broadcast journalism where you and get, get an mm -hmm. activism. And I think that that needs to be addressed by mm -hmm. mainstream media houses, regardless of how tight the economic climate becomes. And in fact, given how tight the economic climate, th this is the opportunity. This is to draw upon the wealth, the energy the, the, of, of activism. But as you say, there has to be financial recognition um, and uh, the extension of protection um, uh, the, the, uh, and a degree of oversight to support those, those who are out in the field. And I think, Shukundali, you're absolutely right to highlight the importance about the, the competitive nature of the profession. So that journalists can be, their, can be, in some situations, be their own, you know, be others, fellow journalists' worst enemy. And, th and this has to be acknowledged. 
because this is this is not s simply a redoubt of, of embattled journalists and editors against the rest of the world. This is a very complicated and contested terrain. Um, and it varies, of course, from Commonwealth country to Commonwealth country. Rita, do you, uh, would, would you like to, to make any uh, particular remarks? Yeah, just um, the, the, the final thing, we've already got about facts, but I also think it's sourcing. We've got to drill home to get the message across to the pub public, to news consumers, check your sources. It's very easy, especially on social media, Facebook, you see an eye-catching headline and you just click without even checking. And I myself can say that I've been sometimes, I have to stop myself, but not being as rigorous with everything in print, I would check the sources. I would see something exciting and then the instinct would be to click and check. And I think, no, no, who is this person? So to get trust is the other issue. And what you need for that, you need the public and the consumers again to look for people in this whole medley of different voices, opinions, for them to go to certain sources, whether it's a news organization or a journalist, say, I trust that person. I will follow that person, which means that they will respect high quality journalism again maybe it's a pipe dream but that's what my wish is thank you thank you very much indeed um colleagues i would like to extend my very sincere and warm thanks to all of you for a very energetic and wide-ranging discussion um and also to to sanjoy in absentia i have to say for highlighting the the critical moment confronting Commonwealth countries and individual countries and societies um, at this moment of the global health crisis and the, and the parallel economic crisis and the extraordinary pressures that there are in the financial sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, but for your honest assessment, um, as well as your indication of possibilities for change and um, to sustain freedom of expression, which is embattled across, um, across the terrain, but it is indeed the canary in the gold mine. Um, Rita and I have discussed this, that freedom of expression, freedom of media is one of the fundamental human rights and people uh, lose sight of that at their peril. And yet this is a point of, of peril for too many countries across the globe where authoritarian governments are manipulating, uh, taking advantage of, distorting, using vaguely framed uh, legislation around national security uh, to squash potential criticism, to failing to protect journalists as key workers um, who need to deliver the uncomfortable messages about the dysfunctional delivery and breakdown of government responsibility in terms of healthcare delivery to its citizens. Um, for highlighting the multiplicity of challenges and dangers of intimidation, of attacks, but also the contested terrain of journalism itself. We've highlighted the importance of education and where there are areas for improvement, the importance of fact checking and where the Commonwealth as an entity could work to improve and support fact checking, where Commonwealth governments can in fact um, accept uh, greater need for sanction um, against f those who fail to deliver um, their commitment to values around freedom of expression, but also where those governments are indeed champions, where there are opportunities um, which journalists need to shift their cultures to exploiting uh, freedom of information with the due recognition that there are, should we say, insidious barriers and, and bureaucratic inertia, which you may encounter, as well as government official blockages for accessing the, the information to which they are entitled. Um, my sincere, sincere thanks to all of you for your energetic and deeply knowledgeable uh, remarks. I'm enormously grateful. I'm very grateful also to Debbie Ranson, who is the web manager uh, for the Roundtable, and of course herself a leading journalist from the Caribbean, from BBC World Service. I mean, I'm very pleased to see you there, Debbie. Thank you very much indeed. Um, but to the audience, I hope that I've incorporated your questions around fact-checking, around self-regulation, around compliance. Uh, but I would like to say, I think this has been an enormously valuable discussion of a very important um, challenge to the Commonwealth, the need that we have to take stock, the need that we have to be ideal, uh, to be realistic about the pos possibilities, but that we need the energy of idealism in the potential of the Commonwealth. So saying, all right, where can we work together to collaborate, to improve? And this is going to be in a multiplicity of fora and needing those different professional connections that Coyote highlighted. So thank you very much. Colleagues, are there any final remarks that you would like to make before I draw this to a close? Um, just, just, just to say, Sue, uh, thank you very much for excellent chairing. Um, 
thanks thanks to our wonderful panel for for a wonderfully you know fantastic right. wide ranging discussion. Um, we're we're going to uh, have a virtual coffee break. Excellent. Um, I hope you'll enjoy something better than virtual <laughs> coffee. Um, and we'll start promptly again at twelve o'clock with the related topic of threats to democracy in in the Commonwealth. And those that panel will then be followed by panels on Windrush, colonial reparations, and LGBT rights. So uh, uh, um, a, a packed program still to come. But, but thank you so much, everyone, for a, a really wonderful discussion. Thank you for, for your time and for your enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank you.